Welcome, I'm John Caldera, President of the Independence Institute and your Devil's Advocate. You know, you might not be hearing him on the airwaves, but sadly, he's still talking into a mic. Michael Brown, good to have you here. Good to see you again, so, yeah, John. Oh, oh, actually, just out of curiosity, yeah. so now you're doing podcasting. You've yes. done a lot of local and uh, syndicated radio. Right. And before that, you were the FEMA. Right. FEMA director, is that yeah. the right? All right. Yeah. Out of all those gigs, which one was best? You can't compare them because, look, as, when I was the Under Secretary of Homeland Security, you're working closely with the White House, you're traveling on Air Force One, you're, out, you're, I mean, you're traveling the world, you're doing all sorts of things. So that's that. And of course, it was fantastic. Microphone. How'd you get that gig, by the way? Um, a friend of mine who was, uh, at the time, the candidate, George W. Bush's campaign manager, he and I went to uh, college together and knew each other forever. And, uh, oh, so it's just nepotism. It's all nepotism. It's, it's all about who you know. It's, and, and when you put together an administration, who do you want? You want people that you know and can trust. And I'd met W when his dad was running for president back in 1988 and developed a relationship over the year. And so they called me to be general counsel. So worked my way up the ladder. So you were general counsel. Started out as general counsel. For? Right. For FEMA. For FEMA. Right. And then you assassinated the head. No, and the, 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 the head quit, and so the president appointed me the director. Then Congress decided they wanted to create the Department of Homeland Security. So the White House calls and says, we're going to put together a transition team. We need, we need, we've got a transition leader, and we need four team, lead, te team members. Will you be one of those team members? And I said yes, and that led to becoming the Undersecretary of Homeland Security. Wow. And then Katrina, of course, hit. And it took me about five seconds to decide, do I stay in Washington or come back home to Colorado? And we came back home to Colorado, and I went on air. Stupid question. What's the pay? I mean, is what's it a good thing? For, what's the pay for what? For, for Under FEMA. Secretary? Yeah. I mean, is this... Is I this... want to say it was, 100, it was a hundred and maybe $180,000 a year or something. It was good. Yeah. Yeah, it wasn't bad. Plus, plus pen, all the bennies and all the rest. Yeah, so. but all the bennies. But people have this misconception. Everybody thinks that because I was the undersecretary or I was a general counsel, director, and undersecretary for six years, they think that I walked away with a full pension right. and all of this money. And I, no, I was a political appointee. I walked away with nothing other than what I had socked into the thrift, the thrift saving plan that all federal employees have. Right. Yeah, I've, I've, I've known folks who've been... Uh, department heads or in the cabinet you know, right that's really cool and and so so it must be great you must have a staff that that shops for you and you know and somebody drives you it's like what are you hi uh apparently i, I talked to uh, gail norton who's a good friend and, and when she was secretary of the interior she she was in, in apparently just a gorgeous office because some guy in the 50s who yes, had it right. specked it out yes. as a whole apartment building right, they didn't live is. there but yeah. he did at yeah. the time yeah. so um yeah, that'd be fun. But so, if if you call W, will he answer? Well, no, he won't answer. But chief of staff will. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good stuff. And Jeb will call. I mean, I'll talk to Jeb. The thing, the, the perk that I missed the most was the security detail. And because of the kind of work I did, you know, I had to have comms with me all the time. So I had the comms you know, being a communications. communications. Yeah. So I had. Wait, the, wait, when you like a public information officer or, or some the equipment communication. The, the, the equipment. Okay. Now I had I had a press secretary, okay. but I also had all the equipment. So even at our vacation home, at our home in Colorado, and our home in Virginia, we had a. It's called a Stu or a Steve. They're secure communications equipment that enabled you to connect to either Air Force One or the White House Situation Room, and you can have a secure. My kids called it the bat phone. So I had bat right. phones everywhere, and then I had. See, funny, what, what I just heard was, I got three homes. That's what I heard. I well, heard you I, have it, three homes. Well, at the time I did, but it was a killer. That's why. That's why we, I laugh about people who are members of Congress right. that try to live in the district and, and live back home, right, or, or live in D.C. It's like holy cow. I mean, it's it. So that hundred eighty-six thousand dollars, boy, it goes fast. It goes real fast. But the security detail meant I didn't have to deal with TSA. Oh, no. I didn't have to deal with traffic. I didn't have to deal with any of that. What do you mean you didn't have to deal with traffic? Well, if, if we People were... get out of your way for you, or...? Well, yes. If we were, if we were on our way to a disaster area, okay, say, say we, had right, land, right. we had landed at DIA and we were trying to get to a get forest to fire in Aspen, boom, 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 lights, and we get there. Really? Or, or I'd just get on a Blackhawk and skip everything. You're kidding. No. Oh, were, that uh, would be no, cool. It was, it was totally cool. Totally cool. Or, you, or take this, my favorite experience, I think my favorite experience, taking off in Marine One on the South Lawn to go so, to Andrews with the president. Right. That's a view that 
very few people get to see. That would be awesome. Yeah, that was cool. That was cool. Yeah. All right. And by the way, have you, I made you jealous yet? No. Okay. No. All right. okay. Let's see. I see. Right. I see what you look like. <laughs> um, the book you wrote about Katrina. Let's just touch on that for a second, yeah. because I mean, people see it. You mentioned it. I, I, give me the quick lesson of what you learned after Katrina, because you were the fall guy for a lot of a, a lot of bad things. Right. And uh, what what was the mistake in Katrina? Looking back at it, you look at this this terrible thing. What would have stopped it? A prepared. Well, I'll say at the, at the lowest level, uh, a mayor that knew what he was doing or a governor that knew what she was doing. Because if, it, it if, was if a, the mayor knew what he was doing, what would he have done differently? He would have, he would have ordered a mandatory evacuation before landfall, well before landfall, at least 72 hours before landfall. He would not have designated the New Orleans Superdome as a shelter of last resort. Because when you tell people, oh, if you don't want to evacuate, you still want to party in, on Bourbon Street, and then things really hit the fan, oh, you can go over here and you can stay there. Well, I had engineering reports that said that the Superdome wouldn't withstand a Category 3, and we had a Category 5 coming up the Mississippi River. So, of course, I scream at him and try to get him to, to withdraw that order, and he wouldn't do it. So people went to the Superdome, and, of course, we had medical teams there. We had supplies there, but we didn't have enough for the number of people that showed up. What would the governor have done differently? She would have... Those two were at loggerheads. It was... Louisiana politics at its worst. And so you had those two fighting each other, and if she had had the cojones that she really needed, she would have overridden the mayor, and she would have, as the governor, stepped in and ordered a mandatory evacuation. What did the feds do wrong, either you or the president? We, 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 I, let, I, we let the media get in front of us. That's what we yeah. did. It was, the largest, it was the largest logistical movement since 9-11. It was larger than 9-11 in terms of logistics. It was the most massive. Rush Limbaugh's talked about this on his program. It was the most massive movement of, of equipment, personnel, and supplies in the history of this country. And so we had everything there. But the problem was we had a Superdome that was full of people that were screaming about it's hot, you know, it's humid, uh, all we have to eat are MREs. And, and of course, my response was, you're safe. You didn't evacuate, whether you could or could not, whatever the reason is, you didn't evacuate. We're trying to get you out as quickly as possible. But that's not good enough for the media, particularly when you're a Republican. Well, and the whole thought of, and remind me of the history. It looked like everything was okay. It looked like the danger had passed and then the levee broke. Do yes. I have that right? Yes. So from all, you know, the reason the, the president's playing golf is, the danger had subsided. Yes. But it hadn't. Right. And, but we had warned. We had, there, there's actually a, a, a conference call that I was so mad about the media narrative that I actually, first time in my life I, I've ever leaked anything. I, I took the conference call with the, all of the governors, the yeah. presidents down at Crawford, and I'm screaming about the Superdome, and I'm screaming about this. Max Mayfield, who was the director of the National Hurricane Center, he's screaming about stuff. And everybody kept saying, well, nobody knew this was going to happen. We warned everybody it was going to happen. So I called my friend Ron Fournier, who was at the Associated Press at the time, and said, Ron, watch that. Okay. Yeah. All right. The book. Just pimp sure. the book one more time, because yeah. people, people are fascinated by this. And you, you wrote a book to set the record straight. Yeah. We talked about it before, but well, the, 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 title, the, title, the title of the book is Deadly Indifference. And you, you say it's to set the record straight. It is, to a certain degree, to set the record straight. But I admit in, the, in that book some of the mistakes that I made. Uh, I, failed, I failed to see the absolute ineptness of the New Orleans infrastructure the absolute ineptness of New Orleans government and Louisiana government. I failed to look at those things and realize what the consequences could be in a real-life disaster. Before we run out of time, you're broadcasting now on the Internet, yes. not over the air. And right. You, I hope you return to over the air at some point, but tell me about podcasting. Now, for an old guy like you to go from radio to the computer is pretty, pretty fascinating. What have you learned? I've learned that it's, um, 
you can you can do whatever I call it Michael Brown unplugged for the for the very reason I am unplugged I'm not regulated by the FCC even though it's not I don't curse or anything like you do all the time so it's it's still pretty it's still clean but it just allows me to uh, just have fun and I do about one hour five days a week and my numbers have my digital numbers have exceeded what my digital numbers were when I was on terrestrial radio. It's explain explain digital numbers on terrestrial radio because on radio they're trying as best to move people who are listening over air to also listen online or whenever you like through yes. through podcasting. Right. And you had really good numbers, right. particularly on, on online. Yeah. Um, and you're doing better than that. Yes. I, Why? I, I'm at a well, one, you... I mean, you, I, mean, I understand. I do a lot of radio, but my audience, they've fallen down and they can't get up, so they can't change a station with, with a well, podcast. Well, I, I, I marketed it with social media to make sure that when I, left, when I left radio, that they knew where they could find me, and then I use a, a team to market the podcast. Uh, I'm working on getting it syndicated. Um, I still want to go back to terrestrial radio, which may or may not happen, but it, even if I do that... I'm not going to stop this podcast because the, the numbers just continue to inch up little by little. And I can, look at, I can look at where people are listening. So, you know, i got people listening in Dallas and Pennsylvania and Florida. I mean, it's amazing where, because now people can listen anywhere and they can listen at their convenience. The, the podcast is uploaded every morning at 2 a.m. Mountain Time so that if you have a podcast app, whatever it is, it will automatically download. So... And I'm and I'm sure you've already, already subscribed to my podcast so that you listen get to it. it. I, I, I listen to it an sleep. hour a day, five days a week. In well, fact, well, yeah, that's, that's all that's, I do. That's all I ask. I close my eyes and that's I, I just think. all I ask. Last question: If you got a call from the Trump administration now saying, "Hey, we need you to to go back and do homeland security or something like that," would you? Um, I'd have to talk to the wife first, and probably have to talk to a divorce lawyer second. And if both of them gave you the go-ahead? Uh, well, yeah, to serve your country. Look, serving your country, whether you're serving your country in the military or you're serving your country as the Undersecretary of Homeland Security, it's one of the greatest experiences you can ever have. Michael Brown, thank you so much. Anytime. We'll, we'll do it again soon. Right. Stay tuned.